this week, and I'm going to let Dr. Buzz Cook uh, do the honors of introducing our esteemed speaker. So, Buzz, the floor right. is yours. Thank you very much. I'm Buzz Klutz, and uh, I work with a team on the fifth floor of PHRC. We call ourselves the Soil Health Labs, and we've been around for probably about 10 years. Um, and a lot of the stuff that we've sort of got involved in in the last, uh, oh, I don't know, two to three years was the notion that livestock can be beneficial, in fact, essential components to restore, uh, restoring degraded agricultural systems. Now that sounds counterintuitive to many folks. I know there are many environmental advocates that advocate against livestock. And so we're trying to look at changing that paradigm uh, within our small community. And um, one of the things that happened in in the life of Lacey, who's been with us, how long have you been with us? You're six now. You're, oh my goodness, really? Oh gosh, okay. So when Lacey, Lacey came to me and wanted to do a, a, a master's degree, and I, when I saw her smiling at me and knowing, okay, she's going to try and persuade me to do something, she, I just said, oh, please, not a water quality project, uh, because I'm an aquatic scientist, but I've fallen in love with soils, uh, because I think if we fix soils, water quality takes care of itself. But Lacey started talking to me about compost and turf grass, and compost was one of my love languages at that point. And so uh, I immediately said, okay, we'll, we'll work on that. Got her master's degree and did some really good plot science um, in um, a Bermuda grass uh, field. And uh, we thought when Casey was gonna, Lacey was going to join us that she was going to be a plot scientist. And we thought that for about a year. And then um, Lacey got involved with, Dr. Jamie Lead in iCorps, I right? Uh, and one of the things we realized about Lacey is she is an incredibly good communicator and listener. And that changed the course of her uh, dissertation and work. And um, you'll see now that she is applying the science, but more to a semantic point of view rather than a uh, uh, rather than experimental plots. So there's this empirical research that Lacey has done, and we had a great data set that we were able to throw at Lacey. And so she's going to talk to you about that. But it's amazing, I guess, um, how uh, when we start paying attention, how life allows us to see things from a different angle. And we're really, really grateful that Lacey has taken this turn. Uh, and I think it's somewhat unique. Our South Dakota partners are also very excited about this work. So I'm gonna leave the rest to you, Lacey. Okay. Well, thank you for that introduction um, and for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm gonna be presenting on a comparison of producer interview structures for science communication and implementation in agriculture. Um, and so I'm really excited to get to talk about the work I've been doing and everything I have on this front. Um, and I also got to sit through Ryan's presentation last week, um, which was phenomenal. And I'm excited to follow that up with a very different type of research um, and get to discuss that today. And I personally love the diversity and interconnectedness within our department. And it's really helped me to understand why it is we're actually public health. Um, my master's is from Earth, Ocean, and Environment here. Um, and so kind of like looking at the comparison of those has been really cool for me understanding why it is we are actually in this school. So um, before I get into it, I'm with Soil Health Labs, um, which Buzz just mentioned. And this work um, was funded through NSF i with Dr. Lee, as well as um, the USDA and RCS. Um, so I'm gonna start with an introduction, some background, a couple key ideas from literature. My goal in this presentation is to present different interview styles and how to analyze them. Um, I'm gonna first discuss some quantitative interviews and analysis, and then I'll spend more time diving into qualitative interviews and analysis, 
I have two qualitative cases to compare. And then finally, I'll wrap up with some conclusions and where this work is taking me now. So why use stakeholder interviews in the first place? Um, this is not necessarily our typical science training. Um, it's a much more interdisciplinary approach. As part of Soil Health Labs, I'm going to be speaking with an agricultural focus um, because that's my area of research. But this definitely holds true in a variety of other fields. Um, I'm going to frequently refer to producers today throughout the talk. Um, and I'm just using that term to encompass farmers, ranchers, fruit and vegetable growers. So sort of agricultural producers as a whole there. Um, and literature actually suggests that there's a particular disconnect between science communication um, and these agricultural producers, making this topic especially important. And I would even dare to say this might be easier to implement in other fields if you're looking to do similar work. Um, and so we're in the School of Public Health. I've already mentioned that. And part of public health includes outreach and engagement, working with the public. Interviews are just one way to incorporate engagement directly into research. Um, and as a particular note, I'm specifically referring to interviews today, not surveys or sent out questionnaires. Um, while surveys can provide some background information, they typically don't lend themselves to the same type of engagement, interaction, and relationship building. Science communication is a rapidly growing field, um, and it's really forcing us to think um, as it continues to grow as science communication, not just as an afterthought of research, but actually as a part of your research. Um, and we see that in things like NSF proposal requirements um, with broader impacts and communication plan, that this really is starting to grow and be expected. Um, and so I, like I mentioned, I'm going to talk particularly about agriculture today. And we're starting to see the term uh, climate smart agriculture being discussed more and more. Um, but how we get buy-in on that is really a key issue. Um, I was at a conference this summer and researchers presented uh, their information and outcomes from a survey about how the term climate smart agriculture is not widely accepted within the agriculture community. Um, I will note that they used surveys, which means that they don't have any ability to ask follow-up questions or rephrase. Um, and regardless really of how you want to phrase it, we know that this is important and communication in this aspect is going to be crucial for getting people on board. Um, I specifically chose a picture. Buzz kind of started mentioning this already in his introduction. I specifically chose a picture of cattle grazing because livestock can and should be an important resource and component of climate smart agriculture or regenerative agriculture, which is what we particularly focus on within our lab group. Regenerative agriculture is a holistic approach to agriculture that goes beyond sustainability and aims to restore soils in the environment instead of just maintain them. It focuses on five key principles being keeping the soil covered, having a living root in the soil, minimum disturbance, aka no-till, um, maximizing diversity, and integrating animals. So integrating am animals is a key component of regenerative agriculture. However, even the best research practices do not have the kind of impact that we want to see to address our environmental problems and changing climate if they're not actually implemented beyond our labs. So this is where producer interviews really comes in for me. So where are we starting? Um, I'm gonna provide some background. I wanna just highlight a few key points that I've learned um, digging through the literature. There is definitely a spectrum of science communication serving a variety of purposes. For many years, research outputs have been focused on sharing results in papers and in academic journals. The idea of science communication um, expanded and has since been functioning mostly from a deficit model. Um, and this model aims to provide expertise and fill in gaps of knowledge. The idea is that as scientists, we have this knowledge and that we're trying to share it. Um, and this might be done through lectures, presentations, um, and this is more of what we've actually received training on as scientists, more so how to give good presentations. Um, and I would argue that academic presentations and things that I'm doing today probably fall somewhere in between these first two because I am sharing information. However, it's with people that are relatively in my field already. Um, now science communication is growing again and expanding to include not just talking, but also listening. It's moving to more two-way communication and is trying to be more inclusive of different people, experiences, and expertise. 
None of this is to say that communication within our field is bad or without purpose. Um, it most certainly has a role in research. Um, all science communication relies on sound scientific research. So that's still a key component. Um, and this is gonna be more appropriate in different types of work. Different types of work and research fit better on different areas of the spectrum. Um, and my main point here is just that if we're claiming to do applied research, it's really important to consider how our work fits into that applied field. So here's what really changed my mind on this. Um, one paper in particular was an epiphany for me. Um, I had spent several, several years, um, both my master's and now in my PhD, um, in soil health labs, and I loved that we got to work directly with producers. However, I was still largely focused on the practices. Um, I focused on what we wanted to see implemented, not how or why producers would actually get this implemented. And at that point, I had actually already started doing these NSF I Corps interviews. I just really had no idea how I was going to incorporate them into my research. Um, so Gosnell et al. did interviews with regenerative ranchers in Australia. And the main outcome from this work was these different spheres that play into producers' decision making. So there is a political, practical, and personal sphere, all of which imp um, impact the management practices that producers do or don't implement. Um, a great presentation on environmental benefits is actually not one of these spheres. It might fit into one of them, but the idea that a phenomenal presentation is going to entirely change the way a producer thinks is probably not the case, um, according to this work. So of the three spheres, um, the political sphere is more so current systems in place, perhaps like crop insurance or subsidies, even um, resources like grant funding. And usually our research fits pretty well in here. Then you get into the practical sphere. Um, so the time and labor required, the costs, these are things that we typically think about when we're trying to get practices implemented into the field. And then we have the personal sphere, which is a lot of the values and the emotions. And this is where we can really start to see a disconnect. Um, and we even see challenges from some assumptions like uh, farmers don't care about the environment is kind of a common mindset I hear. And that sort of starts to aim at these personal spheres. Um, the personal sphere and the impacts it has on producer, producer decision making really confirmed not only my own experiences with my work here, but it really changed the way I see interviews and the role that they could play. These underlying motivators or deterrents reminded me that implementation of farm management practices has a lot more to do with than just research, there's a substantial human component involved here. Um, and so for example, um, it's easy for me to look at the research and say that going no-till is great for the environment and good for soil health and everybody should be doing it. However, when you think about it in terms of these spheres, yes, it might be great for the environment, but there's practical changes that go along with going no-till. For example, if you've decided to utilize a cover crop instead, um, you now have to change the way that you're going to plant into that cover crop might have been different than when you were previously tilling your field. So you might be changing your equipment, you might be changing your practices, um, and then you bring in the cultural and societal pressures when your neighbor's looking at you, um, judging what you're doing, thinking you're crazy because now you're going against the norm. So now we have different cultural pressures coming in. And lastly, there's a lot of personal factors um, that come into play because you're asking people to change what produces their livelihood. Um, this is not an easy change or something simple for them. This is their livelihood and likely something that they've been doing for generations. Um, so we certainly need good research, solid research to support these practices, but we also need to understand what it actually takes to make change um, beyond the research results. So getting into some of the interviews I've done, I'm going to start discussing the quantitative interviews first. Um, because I think they're a great starting point for utilizing interviews, and they allow for more quantitative analysis that often as scientists we're a little more familiar with. So I conducted 108 interviews as part of NSF i in winter of 2021. In this program, we started with a laboratory research-based technology, and the goal is to find a market for this technology. Um, and so kind of walking through this customer discovery model that I have up, 
Um, in blue, you see the customer discovery section. You have a technology, you hypothesize who you think your customer is gonna be and the value that your technology brings. You start interviewing those customers to see if they actually are a potential customer and if they really do need this product or if they have the problems you think they do. Um, and then you're finding the key components that your technology really can address. Um, and then at any point, if your customer doesn't match, you're going back to that hypothesis stage and trying to find a new customer segment. And I'll walk through an example of that in a minute and share some of the results, but more about those interviews. So these interviews, all 108 interviews are semi-structured, open-ended interviews done mostly via Zoom um, or over the phone because we were still in the height of online everything in 2021. Um, and so even though they were semi-structured, they still are lending themselves to a more quantitative um, type of analysis based on how we conducted them and how we took notes during them. Um, but semi-structured could potentially be a qualitative analysis that I will speak more to later. Um, so really, we were listening for highlights and key points, which is why we kind of ended up in this more quantitative area um, and relating them back to our research technology. Um, we took notes during these interviews as producers answers questions and, um, like I said, have them move forward for the analysis. So to start with, I'll walk you through this process. Um, to start with, our initial technology um, focused on aflatoxins um, and being able to reduce aflatoxin contamination in grain. In the literature, in the scientific literature, this seemed like a huge issue that really needed a solution. Our lab technology indicated that it would be a great solution to this problem. However, we hypothesized that our customer segment would be grain producers where this aflatoxin was contaminating the grain. Once we started talking to farmers that were producing grain, we did not find that they were concerned about aflatoxin at all. So then we went back and had to rehypothesize and come up with a new customer segment because we found that even though the literature suggested that was a huge issue and maybe it will be down the road, it just was not currently a main concern for grain producers actually out in the field. So then we went through and investigated harmful algal blooms, um, particularly looking at red tide in Florida. And for key problems, that was definitely a key concern. But the issue was we didn't have a very clear customer in terms of who would actually buy this or who would actually implement it. So we knew there was a problem, but we still didn't know exactly who was gonna be in charge of it. So we went back to the drawing board again and then we ended up doing the majority of our interviews um, within the citrus community in Florida. And citrus producers, um, the grove managers are who we focused on as our customer segment. And the key problem that they're facing is a disease called HLB, also known as citrus greening, that's infecting trees. And so with that, we were then finally able to move into this green box, which is more of what um, Maddie Myers and I are currently working on, which is a method to be able to validate these um, customers and the value that our product would bring in that aspect. So moving on to a little bit more of the results, I know there's a lot on this page, but I promise I will walk through it. Um, overall, like I said, we did 108 interviews, only 105 of them are shown in that first graph because three of the interviews um, didn't really fit in any of these categories as we were investigating. We used a simple binomial approach of just going with, yes, um, this is a customer or no, it's not. Um, we assumed that people are roughly indifferent and so we assigned a one to those that responded their business needs this technology. It was a must have. Um, and a zero if they expressed that they either didn't need it or they didn't feel strongly about it. So then we took the 65 interviews that are in that citrus um, component on the far right of the first graph. Um, and then we wanted to validate, is that really a strong customer segment? Which brought us to the next issue of how do we count the interviews? Um, there were 65 in that citrus segment. However, not all 65 are what we consider end users. And I think this is really important um, to understand who you're talking to and how to weigh their opinions that they're giving you. Um, so we were only counting, we divided those 65 into either end users and decision makers, meaning they're the people that could actually buy and implement this technology. And then influencers, meaning that they're people that might suggest that people buy it or they might play a role in these businesses. However, they don't actually have the power to purchase and implement. 
So when selling a technology, this probably seems obvious, like I just mentioned, other times it's a little bit less clear, but it's still really important to know who you're interviewing and where they fit in with your research. So for example, right now, if I am talking to working in agriculture and talking to extension agents, they might be great for helping get information out, but they can't force farmers to go implement these practices. So if I'm going to talk to extension agents, I need to know that they don't have the power to actually implement. They do have the power to spread the word and influence. So that's why we sort of broke those into two different segments is because that's going to affect. We don't want influencers to make us validate this customer segment if they can't actually implement the product or the change. So um, with those 65 interviews, we broke them down with the 35 being our end users. And so we use those 35 end users um, as our customer segment, 33 of which said that they must have a solution to this problem. Um, and this was uh, clearly able to be validated, very strong um, correlation there. Um, and so then we, yes. 33% or 33 out of 35? 33 out of 35. 33 of our 35 citrus producers said they must have an answer to this. We were doing this simply as a count and then using binomial analysis just to say, yes, this is actually um, statistically significant or no, it's not. Because in the business world, um, a lot of this goes off of gut feeling that, oh, I heard a lot of this answer, but not a lot of statistical significance is really brought into this. So we wanted a way um, Maddie and I are currently working on this if we wanted a way to say that this is actually significant, which then um, became even more clear when you move into this third and final table here where we looked at the value propositions. And so the value propositions are really just what value does your product bring? What does it address? Um, and so in this case, value proposition, we had one, two, and three. Number one is yield. So that's what we could actually statistically say producers that did care about citrus greening care most about the yield. And while this might not seem groundbreaking or crazy in the world of agriculture, it is really important that we could actually say um, with statistical significance that only one of these is where we should move forward. The other two value propositions, for example, like the time and labor required is number three. We could not say with statistical significance that that was the most important. So while some people cared, nine people out of the 33 that said they had to have this technology did care, it's not where we should focus most of our effort. And we thought after doing interviews that all three of these were equally important. So this is where doing some analysis really help us, helped us to differentiate what is the most important and what maybe is not quite as important. So what are some pros and cons? Um, oh, I'm sorry. I will also note that you will see that the sample size um, we're working with is in the 30s here which um, we could follow a normal um, approximation for binomial um, analysis. However, there is a lot of variability that you see um, within the different responses because our sample size um, is in the 30s. Um, so a pro of using interview analysis in this way is that these are really short interviews. We gathered a lot of information and we found some key takeaways. Some cons of that um, are that we sort of lack depth and we had to go back and ask additional questions multiple times. Um, we were sort of biased in our note taking because we were only writing down answers to the questions we cared about. Um, and we were listening for certain answers and marking our data accordingly, um, which really brings me now into a lot more of the qualitative analysis where I've been spending a lot more of my time recently. Um, so, Moving from the quantitative side into this qualitative analysis, um, I have two cases of interviews with South Dakota ranchers who are using regenerative agriculture practices. They were interviewed as part of video series um, for rancher outreach. Um, and I have since analyzed those interviews using InVivo software. InVivo is a commonly used software to assist with qualitative analysis. And each interview was videoed uh, video recorded and then transcribed. Those transcriptions were uploaded into InVivo and then coded. Um, and so I used thematic analysis, which simply means I was focused on different themes present in the interviews and selected portions of each transcript that I wanted to have coded 
into each theme. Um, so before I share the results, I want to tell you a little bit about each set of interviews that I was analyzing. In case A, those are the red pins on the map um, of South Dakota. I said all of these were in South Dakota. So those are the red pins on the map. Um, those were conducted in 2019 as part of the Our Amazing Grasslands series, and it includes 12 interviews. Um, these interviews were unstructured entirely and asked only like prompting questions such as um, talk about your why or tell us a little bit about the operation and how you ended up here. Uh, what do you see for your future here? Very open ended, just prompts. In case B, um, these interviews span from 2020 to 2021 and they are shown in the yellow and some of the green pins. Um, I analyzed 20 interviews in this set um, where each interviewee was asked 10 specific questions. Um, with some follow-up questions used. Um, these were all open-ended as well, and they were semi-structured interviews. Questions here included things like, what's one thing you've done that's been most important for your success? What surprised you the most when you changed the way you were grazing? Um, what are signs of resiliency, and what does that mean to you? Um, the average time of these interviews varied quite a lot. In case A, where they were unstructured, um, average interview time was 84 minutes. In case B, where we were asking these 10 structured questions, um, it was only 16 minutes. So let's get into some of the results of this. Um, the themes for each set of the interviews are shown in both of these tables, with case A being the unstructured interviews on the left and case B being the semi-structured interviews on the right. The themes are all left justified um, and sub themes associated with those themes are slightly indented. You can see how many files that theme appears in in that files category and then how many total references are coded into each theme. For example, water um, with the blue star is the second most referenced theme in both of the cases. It's discussed in all 12 interviews in case A and all 20 interviews of case B. Um, and again, with those longer interview lengths, you'll notice that there are 217 total water references in case A and only 114 in case B, just because there was so much more content to code. Um, initially, we expected that soil um, with the, oh, one of my stars is off, I'm sorry, uh, soil down by the red star, um, we expected to see much higher, seeing as how we are the soil health lab. and um, part of our soil health team made those questions. Um, however, we instead saw that producers did talk about soil. 75% of producers in both cases discussed soil, but more so they talked about the associated management, the improvement to their grasses, the impacts on their family. So they talked about the impacts of their improved soil more than they talked about their soil. In case A, you can see that family is the third most referenced theme with the green star and every interview discusses family. In case B, it's the seventh most referenced theme, um, and only 12 of the 20 interviews are discussing family. Um, this shift in placement is likely due to the different interview structures. Um, in case A, producers spoke about family as something that's important to them and an influencing factor in their decision making. In case B, with the 10 specific questions, there wasn't always as much room to talk about family and those intrinsic motivators, so they moved down on the frequently referenced list. And I'll get more into those underlying themes that were uncovered a little later. There we go. Um, so discussing specifically the theme of water, which, like I said, was the second most referenced theme in both cases, and every um, rancher discussed water in both sets of interviews. Um, while this might not be particularly surprising that agriculture needs water, um, it did give a great full circle storyline related to water that came through in these themes through this type of analysis that we hadn't really previously focused on. So rotational grazing means that you're breaking your one larger field into smaller sub pastures, that you're going to rotate your cattle between these sub pastures to be able to keep them on smaller, tighter pieces of land. However, before ranchers can implement this rotational grazing or see any benefits from it, 
they need fencing to separate the pastures into these sub pastures. And they also now need to be able to provide water in each of these pastures instead of maybe just a place or two on the large chunk of land. So they really talked extensively, the producers spoke extensively about the wells and the pipelines and the watering facilities that were needed to make rotational grazing possible. Once it was then implemented and they were able to rotate their cattle, they started seeing the benefits from using this rotational grazing system. Some of those benefits also linked back to water. So you needed water to be able to, ro to, be able to rotate, but then once they were rotating, they saw benefits in the water. For example, uh, many producers spoke about their drought resiliency um, due to improved water infiltration rates. Um, and they also spoke about improved animal health um, because instead of the cattle drinking the water that they're standing in, they were able to drink clean water that was being provided to them, not what they were um, standing in and cooling off. So really the research along with research, ex along with rancher expertise confirmed the benefits of rotational grazing, but to see it get implemented, there were definitely obstacles that needed to be considered and navigated. So sticking with our water theme, I wanna talk a little bit about the importance of hand coating versus using the very enticing auto coating feature that InVivo has. Um, so these are all again from the water theme in case A is where I'm sticking with for this example, which is what I was previously showing. So when I was hand coding, there were 217 different references coded to the theme of water. When auto coding, there were only 18 references coded to the theme of water. You might wonder why there's such a big difference, um, especially when you look at this next table and you see that water count is counted 258 different times. The problem is when you're using the auto coding feature, in vivo is breaking it up into themes and sub themes. So it might get separated into multiple different themes with only 18 references to water. However, when I, as the researcher, am coding, I can see the interconnectedness and make these themes more encompassing and have control over how they get split up. And it's important for consistency and why you're only having one person code these. You can do duplicates, but you want one person to code all of your interviews for consistency here. So getting into the second large chart, um, you'll see here um, that there are the 13 most occurring words within the water theme. All of these represent at least 1% of the total theme of water here. One reason hand coding is so key is because there are different meanings of words. You can look at the similar word category and see that it shows what in vivo groups into that main word. So for example, on the top one, you see that under the word water, in vivo is grouping similar words there, um, irrigate, irrigation, water, watered, waters, all of those are falling into that same theme, which is great until you go down to well, which is listed 80 times. And in this case, well could be meaning good, all good and well, or it could physically be talking about where we are pumping water out of, being a well. And so that's where it's really important that you have context doing this by hand, that you can see what the producer is saying when they were talking about this and it keeps you so much more in tune with the underlying themes um, and really that relational aspect that you're building from the interviews. So as I promised um, a little more into the underlying themes we really um, this was a surprise that we uncovered through this um, analysis process. Um, family and emotion were themes present in both cases um, in case A, all 12 interviews discussed family. In case B, 12 of the 20 interviews discussed family. And this is a clear example of the differences in outcome from the unstructured versus semi-structured style. In case A, the unstructured interviews gave more insight into why behind the practices, like family land, leaving the ranch to their kids, um, the time necessary for different practices to be implemented in relationship to their family life. Um, so for example, in case A, you'll see um, kids here, you'll see time, you'll see generations. Oh, you can't see my mouse moving, sorry. Oh, okay, perfect. 
Um, I can't see it from this angle then. Okay, so then in case B, um, the semi-structured nature leads a little bit less to why and more about the what of practices. So we still see family being discussed here, just not in the same amount of depth. And even in the production of these uh, word clouds, you can tell that there's a little bit more clear of a hierarchy in case A, where it made this nice circle um, and the word sizes are all associated with how much they're used. Uh, in case B, it's not quite as clear cut because it's not used as much. So there's not quite as clear of a hierarchy going on there. And this underlying theme um, that was uncovered through the thematic analysis really reminded me of the importance of science communication and why I'm doing this. And we're really looking at this as how we better frame what we want to communicate. Because ultimately we are communicating with people about practices. We're not communicating with practices. Um, and so these word clouds really relate back to that personal sphere I mentioned at the beginning in terms of the relational aspect of this work. Working alongside producers and understanding their motivation improves our chances of getting research implemented. Um, we have a better chance at long-term buy-in from stakeholders by talking about research in a context that's important to them and is meaningful to them. We're still talking about research and we're still using sound science but we're putting it in a context that means something to them. Um, so some conclusions from my work. First of all, we really need clear goals for interviews. Each interview style had very different outcomes and all provided insights, but it's important to know what you're trying to get from these interviews before you start doing them and design your questions accordingly. So are you looking for motivating factors um, are you looking for what practices are currently used or are you looking to quantify the main need? All of those need very different types of interview structures, analysis, um, and planning. I also highly recommend uh, recording all interviews in addition to taking notes because there is a wealth of knowledge in the interviews that might be missed beyond your note taking. Um, additionally, sometimes I would go on the verge to say oftentimes interviews give us context that call for alterations or further research. Um, and that's exactly what we had happen with our i experience leading to multiple pivots in our customer group. Um, and that's entirely okay. If anything, that's the point of conducting interviews is to gain this additional context. However, um, it's also a reason to not wait till the very end to do these interviews. Because if you're gonna need further research and if you're gonna need to pivot, you wanna know earlier in your work, not at the very end when your grant is over. Um, hurdles are much easier to address when you know about them. For example, I spoke about water and rotational grazing and how rotational grazing requires additional fencing and access to water. There are plenty of grants and partnerships to make this happen. Um, However, you need to know that that's an issue to be able to set some of those things up. In a more recent example, um, I was working with a producer in South Carolina um, who decided he wanted to start using cover crops, but he didn't know how he was going to plant his next crop into them after having cover crops because his previous planting equipment wasn't going to work in this new scenario. Um, so we were able to help connect him um, with a no-till drill rental that he could plant into these cover crops. Um, and so he was motivated to implement this, but it still wasn't going to work the same way as our research trials did because of this missing context and the difference in equipment and setup. Um, lastly, research helps make huge strides in public health um, and beyond, but we aren't the only experts and we can learn a lot from others' expertise. Um, I am constantly learning from producers in the field and interviews have really given me a great way to incorporate that information. Ultimately, producers see their fields more frequently and for longer duration than I do. So being able to have a way to utilize and incorporate their experiences and their expertise on their land helps strengthen our research. Um, Overall, utilizing interviews and associated analysis helps make research more meaningful and increases the odds of it being implemented long term and long beyond a grant time frame, because ultimately that's what we want. We don't want these producers to stop just because the grant's over. We want their buy in. 
So why did I choose to talk about this today? Um, first of all, I know not everybody works in agriculture, but agriculture impacts all of us. We all eat food. Um, and sometimes we get really guilty of finger pointing. I know I do, um, especially before I started this work. The research made it clear to me that regenerative practices are better for the environment, um, but I was overlooking what it actually took to get those practices implemented. Um, and so working within the agricultural community has really showed me how unproductive finger pointing and the blame game are. They don't really help anyone. I also wanted to share this as encouragement. I was really passionate um, about this type of science communication and outreach work, but I didn't have a lot of training or know where to go with it. Um, I've had various opportunities to present on this now, and I really want to be able to encourage others to integrate science communication, maybe interviews, into your research. Um, and I encourage you to use this as an addition to your literature review. Get additional context, get different perspectives um, beyond just our scientific literature when appropriate. Um, and then I wanted to be able to provide some just practical things that I've learned um, and some tips to consider, like recording your interviews, um, even if you don't think you need it. And so where is this taking me next? Um, the last section of my project uh, really brought all of this together. Um, I developed a questionnaire and have done interviews with 30 small scale underrepresented producers here in South Carolina. Um, and then those are awaiting analysis. So to be determined on the outcomes of those interviews. Um, and we're implementing some practices, some soil health practices with a handful of the producers that we interviewed here in South Carolina. So um, before I wrap up, thank you for the opportunity to present. And I'd like to give a special thank you to a number of people who have helped make this possible for me. Dr. Jamie Lead for the opportunity to participate in the NSF i program and how influential that's really been for my work. Um, Maddie Myers, who is working on all of the i data analysis with me. And we currently have a manuscript in progress on that. Um, obviously, Dr. Buzz Clute, who has been my advisor for six years now and continues to be a phenomenal support in many ways. Dr. Gabe Keeney for continuously being a great resource, an example, and an encourager. Um, and for all of Soil Health Labs and Growing Resilience team, um, just for the access to these interviews, for their help, for their feedback. Um, and then lastly, for the USDA Nat Natural Resource Conservation Services and the South Dakota Grasslands Coalition who provided funding um, for all of these South Dakota interviews and have allowed me to use them for my analysis. So I think I have just a few minutes. Um, perfect, we have about 15 minutes left for questions. The fortunate and unfortunate news is that uh, we had a server glitch. By we, I really just mean Lacey had a server glitch uh, within our Soil Health Lab server. And I ended up recoding all of case B. Um, and that was frustrating as somebody who is approaching a hopeful dissertation. Um, however, it also was a really good learning experience because I realized when I went through it a second time that not only had my skill set gotten a lot better, um, but I honestly did a better job coding it because I knew more of what I was doing. Um, and I realized a previous error um, in the, what, what I believe is an error um, in the way I was previously presenting um, those themes because of how in vivo outputs um, are automatically formatted. I've chosen to reformat some of that in a way that I believe is a more accurate representation um, of the work I've done. And that just came from more time and experience of using the software and having a better handle on what, what those outputs actually meant. Um, so yes, it was not my most fun experience ever. However, um, I do think it ended up being a really good learning opportunity for me and actually made my results stronger. Let's see if we can hear Dr. Porter one yeah, more time. Ahead. Can you all hear me now? No. No. Sure. Do we have do we have an issue here?
Dr. Porter? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, what was that? The volume button? So great presentation, Lacey. And I saw so many parallels between the engagement with your stakeholders and the engagement that we have with our underserved and environmental justice communities. And when you're referring to the finger pointing that takes place, one of the, what I think, what we think is one of the most significant realizations and acceptances amongst those within the underserved communities is that you all reference it as finger pointing. We talk about the, the use of emotions and they've realized that emo the use of emotions only goes so far in trying to affect positive change. But sound science goes so much further in doing so. So with your reference to finger pointing, is there, is that at times emotional or emotion-based finger pointing? I think that maybe sometimes that is um, on the emotional side. I also think there is a lot of, um, disconnect literature discusses a lot of the disconnect between science and science communication and the agricultural community and i think that disconnect has created um some some finger pointing from both sides because of probably some frustration which would be that emotional side of like i mentioned why isn't everybody no-till well because there's a lot more to it than just the soil health data shows. So there is a lot of strength in science and we do need that sound science. Um, but I also think that there does become, if there's this disconnect and we don't have the context, it becomes really difficult to implement that science um, just because of lack of context and I think lack of understanding. And I think that's where we get a lot of the emotional anger and frustration is because we're not speaking the same language. So a lot of similarities yep. between the, those with which you engage and those with which others of, are engaging. So, yes, like I said, I'm talking about agriculture, but I hope that this is very applicable to a lot of different people's research. Yep, nice job. Yeah, I, I had a quick, quick, just a couple of interesting, I really, this was great. For all of our MPH students, y'all need to be paying attention to this because y'all were doing interviews as part of your, your 724, 725 spring, fall of spring. So you may want to chat with Lacey sometime if you, you see her in the hallway or set up a time to meet with her to gain a little insight. And she only charges $150. <laughs> but one of the things that struck me in your interviews with the word plant, those were terrific. Thank you. And I really love that because there's so much in there. You, you, you could really see in the group B that you guys have nailed the questions. Because when you look at group A, this was an hour and a half. They, they were much more relaxed. Y'all were getting to know each other. In the second one, y'all were all business. Look at one of the words that's in that second one. It's banker. <laughs> now that means you're all business when you're using that word. I got a feeling. And, and one of the, that sort of led me to some ideas about this. If you look at the words that are not used in each interview, does that give you any keys as to where the focus is? Like I would really say that when I saw that banker in that, uh, you may have to go full screen to see I was it. Say, I think we're it have was to... There it was, bankers right at the very Yes, top. at the very top right up here. Clock. And so part of that gets into the context of it. So I can tell you actually from here, um, part of this discussion is that not all of the ranchers, the whole family is full-time on the ranch. So you have this aspect of needing um, loans from bankers, sure. or you have the aspect in this case, actually they um, also work as bankers. They own the bank in town that are able to then lend. So that's where I really get into this idea that, um, you know, there's a relational aspect to this. Oh, yeah. um, and so I can kind of tell you the story of 
these people that I have not, I did not personally do these interviews. Um, I have not met these people in person, but I can tell you that I have a lot of understanding of what they're doing and those relational aspects. And yes, you're also right. So that kind of gets into that idea of um, what's the context, because you have the issue of people being able to going to bankers needing to get loans and the very business side of it. And then you have a little bit more of the personal side of it of, well, yes, we still work in town for things like health insurance. Um, so there's sort of two sides to that coin. And yeah. I think that's where it gets really important to have done the hand coding and be able to know the context that they're using those terms versus just letting auto code populate whatever it does yeah. um, and just having to guess at it. Well, the, the other thing I thought was really interesting you had personal, political, practical. And if you go through those work, we leave on that word class, because what, what I was really thinking, it would be very interesting to go back into those word clouds and classify which one of those, where, where do those go? And what you could actually see what proportion in a pie diagram they're focusing on. Is it political? Is it is it personal? Or is it practical? And, and those are some judgment calls, but it seems like if you go back and do that, and then if you think of three circles overlapping with those three, what, which ones are in all three? And I think even there going, maybe some that yes. Are, and that's where your common ground is going to be. Yes. And going through some of the theme list, you could easily <laughs> see on um, the long list of, here we go, yeah. the long list of themes. Um, that management side that's first um, in case A is very practical. Yeah. Um, maybe a little political in terms of some of the systems that are already in place, um, but pretty much you're looking at a lot of practicality there. Um, but family, for example, is the third one down there, and that's very personal. So even looking at the list of themes and how many references are to it, um, and that gets to your point originally of case A being so much longer. These interviews, which I think are really important when we get the opportunity, were all um, in person. And a lot of mine have also been, for i for example, were all via Zoom. Um, and so things that can help like build that relationship aspect, um, because you're right, for people to talk on average 84 minutes, they're going almost an hour and a half, we're out on their land, we're in their space, where they're comfortable. And that's what's really important, is I'm not asking them to come sit and pose for an interview here in a classroom. Um, we're going to them. And even my producer interviews in South Carolina that I mentioned um, are all, all phone calls that we're discussing on their time, on their comfort level. Um, and so really trying to be accommodating in that so that they feel comfortable to share versus um, kind of putting them on the spot and making it too formal where they don't really feel comfortable talking. Well, this is terrific. And, and one last thing, a new market that I think y'all might want to look at with the Aspen Conference would be mold in households. And, yes. and that is a huge issue with coastal zones. And uh, I would think that would be, if you look right now, the number of companies treating mold in Charleston has probably quadrupled in the last 10, 10 years. And so it would be very interesting to Yes. I would think C Grant or somebody like that might actually be interested in funding to learn more about that because this is a huge issue. That's a great point. Um, and, and, and your technology may have some applications there. To and so much of Florida um, yeah, is going to be <laughs> joining joining that group as well. Yes. I have a quick question. Uh, what service are you use for transcription? Um, okay, two answers to that. Um, originally, transcription was done through Rev, um, which does charge you per minute. Um, it's not a dollar, right? A dollar fifty. <laughs> uh, they upped their prices. Um, more recently, um, not the interviews that were used here, but the South Carolina ones that I have done, um, Adobe Premiere has a transcription option. Um, and so my South Carolina ones, I went through um, Adobe Premiere to have those transcribed because it's part of that software. The software is not free, but um, it's free to then transcribe them once you have the software. It's not quite as technically perfect because Rev has people checking it, whereas Adobe is completely um, done via the computer. Um, it's done with AI. So, um, but since I'm going back through and reading all of these transcripts to code them, um, and I'm the one who did those interviews, it's been perfect for me and it's a free option. Good to know. Good to see. 
yeah, I like technical questions too. I asked Ryan last week. I was like, what software did you make your figures with? They're beautiful. So <laughs> we're here to share. All right. Well, we have two minutes until we have to give up the classroom. If there's any other questions, if not, thank you everybody on Zoom. Thank you so much.